Good morning, FBC. Welcome to church. Pastor Dave here. Sunday, January 23rd, 2022. Welcome to service. Glad to join us online. It was so beautiful this morning. We're in the courtyard again. Why not be in the courtyard? It is gorgeous. A little cold. Sun's out. We had so much rain early. Any more rain? But the last few, maybe a week, has felt like almost summer. So glad you joined us. One quick announcement, uh, maybe two. Last Saturday in our very courtyard here, we partnered with Rise Against Hunger in the city of San Carlos, and we packed over 15,700 meals for those who need food. And they'll go all over our country and all over the world. So Rise Against Hunger, city of San Carlos, partnered with them, almost 16,000 meals. Amazing, did it safely outside, masked up the whole thing. And uh, we're gonna keep doing outreach. We gotta keep going. I know we're still in the season, but we're going to keep going safely and uh, join us when you're ready. Uh, if you're ready next week, we will have lunch in our courtyard after service next week. So January 30th, Sunday next week, 1115, lunch in the courtyard. It'll be a wonderful time of fellowship outside, safe for everybody. So join us when you're ready. Glad you're here online with us now. Let me pray. we got a wonderful service. We're going to worship the Lord and continue walking on this road. Let's pray. Father, thank you for goodness. Thank you for grace. Thank you for kindness. Thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this online community. Thank you for your son. Let us worship you now. Let us learn from your word and let us be encouraged, even though we're not together this morning, but we're together in spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Let's worship. Good morning, First Baptist Church. My name is Dave Matsumura. I'm a good friend of Jerome Madigan's. It's great to be with you uh, once again this Sunday morning. And um, I hear that there's some exciting news that um, you will be opening up and meeting in person very soon. And uh, I was talking with Jerome about that, and that's, that's awesome. Um, my church, Willow Glen Bible Church in San Jose, we've been uh, meeting outdoors 
um, you know, wearing masks and all that stuff uh, for a while. But even with all those restrictions, um, there's just nothing like being together and worshiping God together, um, the body of Christ meeting in, in person, even with like faces covered and distance and all that stuff. It's so much better than, than virtually on a screen. So I would encourage you, do it safely, but go to church when you can. It, it's, it's really great. It's really special. And so, um, but I'm so glad you're here this morning. And uh, let's, let's stand up, turn up your volumes, and let's worship God together through these songs. Here we go. Come to the well that never runs dry Drink of the water, come and thirst no more Come all you sinners, come find his mercy Come to the table, he will satisfy A taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Bring all your failures. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there. Open arms, see his open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. For God so loved, God so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking. God so loved, God so loved the world. Whoa. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Woo. Who breaks the power 
of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is a failing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my. you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave This song came to mind, and it's called This I Believe, the Creed. And um, it's basically singing the Apostles' Creed, just uh, proclaiming the things that we believe about God and we believe about Jesus. And I thought it would be um, a nice thing to sing after what we just heard. And so uh, let's sing it together. Spirit can 
receiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God the Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious light forever seated high I believe in God the I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the time I believe and I believe in you I believe you rose again I believe that Jesus Christ the Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe life eternal I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus for I by the 
in crimson streams. No, your death is hell's defeat. The cross meant to kill is my Forsaken, take 
to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily Here we go. Let's get into the Word again. Matthew 7. We were there last week. I hope you enjoyed kind of that one-off. And I explained to the people on Sunday that in this interim period between Advent, Christmas, and Easter, uh, before we really get into the story of the spring or the story of Lent, if you'll say the season of Lent at least, and the story of the cross, we have about six weeks where we're just going to kind of do one-off sermons. Pastor Jerome will be with us next week. And uh I picked Matthew 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to kind of piggyback on that one. We're going to keep going to Matthew 7. So last week we looked at a famous passage, maybe infamous passage, about two trees. A tree that produces good fruit and a a tree that produces bad fruit. Jesus said the trees that produce good fruit are favored or are a part of the kingdom, right? And then he said the trees that don't produce fruit, we can say bad fruit, are cut off. We also saw a bit about judgment. Judgment's a hard thing to talk about in 2022, but judgment is in the scriptures. There is such a thing about as judgment. As I mentioned, nobody wants to talk about it, but it's in the scriptures. God does not judge the world the way we judge. The way we judge online or face-to-face or in the media, God doesn't judge that way. He judges by light and truth. Specifically, He judges the world on how they received or rejected light and truth in flesh, the Son. The trees that were judged in Matthew 7 were the ones that didn't produce good fruit. And remember what Isaiah said good fruit was, that vineyard parable, righteousness and justice. The people or false teachers alluded to in Matthew 7, 15, they had a defense when Jesus said, you're going to be cut off. Some of them said, Lord, but we practice miracles in your name. We did the miraculous in your name. And as we learned last week, Miracles in the kingdom are the surprise of the grace of God. They are not the main event of the kingdom. Remember, church, who is and who has always been the main event? Jesus, the Son. And I reminded us, don't ever follow those who make the supernatural or the miraculous the main event. Don't follow those movements or ministries. Jesus and the building of his kingdom are the number one thing in the scriptures. Intro, with all that being said, let's continue. Matthew 7, verse 24, where we left off last week. Jesus says this, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Verse 25, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came And the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So Jesus has concluded his great sermon, Matthew 5 through 7. That's the conclusion I just read. Remember, it had three metaphors. Sorry, three metaphors. 
two roads we didn't get to. Maybe we'll get to in a couple weeks. Two trees and two houses. And then Jesus says, everyone in verse 24 who hears these words, not just about what? The trees or the roads, but everyone who has heard these words, my sermon about the kingdom, what the kingdom's like, everyone who hears these words will be a wise man if he obeys. Three metaphors in this little section, Matthew 7. Two roads, two trees, and finally two houses. The first house we saw is built on a rock, and it is a shelter, or it's sheltered from the storm. The second house is built on sand, and it collapses and is ruined, and the collapse is great, Jesus says. Aren't metaphors amazing? Metaphors give us a way of imagining great ideas that otherwise may just become theoretical or abstract. Say it another way. Metaphors bring, when Jesus says them, divine truth from the periphery of thought and debate and even intellectualism to our personal everyday lives. As you may know, Jesus loved metaphors. Jesus was both practical and theological. We should long to be there. He was a man of the people as well as the perfect theologian. You and I will never be a perfect theologian on this side of the grave, but we can study and learn and seek and knock and ask all the while being real people who can talk about real things pertaining to life in 2022. As I mentioned, metaphors abound in the New Testament and the Old. Jesus would often talk about himself in metaphorical language as water, as bread, as wine, as a door, as a road, as a vine, etc., right? Don't discount your imaginations or emotions fully when dealing with Jesus. God created you a certain way. God created you with certain emotions. Now, I'm going to always stand on the rock of our imaginations and our emotions are to enhance our knowledge and understanding of God. They're not to guide it because I too can get highly emotional. I was highly emotional in the fourth quarter of the Dallas game last week. I was so emotional, my 14-year-old saw her videoing me, and I took the phone from her hand because I knew I was acting like a buffoon. But the point is, I don't want to be guided in my walk with Jesus by my emotions, but I want to let my God-given emotions, I want to submit them to God and let my emotions and my imagination enhance my relationship with him. If I said it this way, it would be accurate. It is God's sovereign, redemptive, alternative plan for the fallen world to know him, to understand him, and he can redeem all of us even our wayward emotions and sometimes, I'll say it this way, perverse and corrupt imagination. But God can redeem that. Now the church, not just a building, but the church is a group of people, a royal priesthood, the called out ones. And they are part of God's redemptive plan for the fallen world. You could say it this way. The church is God's alternative society formed around faith and allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be. I think that's accurate, but it doesn't spark my imagination. So that's accurate. The church is an alternative society formed around faith and allegiance to Jesus, but that's kind of heady. And especially in our day, 
A lack of sparking the imagination or the emotion in the right way can be a hindrance to our sharing the good news of the gospel and the kingdom. What are you saying, Pastor? Good question. I am saying your God-given imagination and emotion can be the bridge from abstract to everyday. And this is one of the great reasons, I think, metaphors are so valuable to the Christian faith. The church is referred to in the scriptures as a body, different parts, a beautiful bride, a city, a temple, a vineyard, and my favorite one alluded to in Revelation by John, in my paraphrase, you've heard it, a suburb of heaven, an outpost of heaven. Jesus uses a metaphor in Matthew 7 in the verses we read. Did you catch it? Jesus says, shelter from the storm. Now this phrase, as many of us know, wasn't original to Jesus. But back in the book of Isaiah, it was used three times. In Isaiah chapter 4, he says, Zion during the reign of Messiah will be a shelter from the storm. Then in Isaiah 25, Isaiah says, God is a shelter from the storm to the poor and downcast. Then in Isaiah 32, let's look at it. Isaiah 32, the first two verses. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. We saw that last week. Isaiah's language is consistent through this great prophecy. And princes will rule in justice. Okay? Sounds familiar. 2, verse 2 in Isaiah 32. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind. A shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry place, like shade of a great rock in a weary land. Now Isaiah is being prophetic in all the right ways. This scripture written so long ago in the Old Testament is talking about when Messiah comes, when his kingdom comes, when his new and alternative way comes, there will be a shelter from the storm to the inhabitants. Through his teaching and his ministry and his supernatural miracles that are moving around him and then through his disciples, God is offering a shelter from the storm to a weary and wounded people. Now, my roots are to be fatalistic when talking about, you know, God, the world, the end of time, people rejecting him. But I don't want to be that way. When I read a scripture like this, which, again, this sec section is famous and infamous. This section has been used, as I explained last week on Sunday, to beat people over the head into submission and almost fire insurance, getting out of hell. We can talk about that. But I want to also see it in a greater light. Jesus in this last section of the Sermon on the Mount is bringing Isaiah's metaphor to fruition and offering to show people how the kingdom will be built. Inviting people, I should say, to come with him as he build his kingdom. As I mentioned, I've preached this passage, especially Matthew 7, 13 and 14, and I've given the sinner's prayer, and I've talked about eternal hell, and we can talk about that, but I want to attack it a different way this morning, because there's still work to do, as I mentioned last week. So I believe in Isaiah 32, he is talking about a group of people, a royal family, a royal priesthood, and Jesus refers to that scripture in Matthew 7. 
could Jesus be talking about a group of people as well? Is the Sermon on the Mount personal? Yes. We're called to obey that. That's almost like the Bill of Rights for the Christian. This is how we obey. We don't lust after the opposite sex like dogs. We forgive infinitely. When we're asked to go one mile, we go two to prove to all who are watching that we're not simply governed by a civic law, but we're governed by the royal law, the law of heaven, which is love and mercy and grace. And there's much more in the Sermon on the Mount. So we see that and take that on personally, but as Christians, as members of a local church and the greater church, we also see it collectively as a whole. So when Jesus was giving this sermon, there was an existing house in Judaism. It was called the temple. It was established. It had been around for a thousand years. Jesus, in his ministry, would expose the hypocrisy, the false teaching, the corruption, the legalism, the elitism, and he would show that the temple and its ways are coming to an end, and there's a new way coming, there's a new kingdom coming, there's a new government, it is the kingdom of God. He and his ministry would tell of the temple's impending doom. We touched on that last week. Let's look at our metaphor today again. Two houses, one built on sand, and it will be destroyed when the storm comes, one built on a rock, and it will remain. The temple was built on false pretenses. Not the actual building, don't go there, but the organization of the temple, the hierarchy of the temple. It was built on the false pretense of religious pride. It was nationalistic in all the wrong ways. It held those who were deemed lower in society or looked down upon to the letter of the law while the elite kind of did whatever they wanted. The old adage, rules for thee but not for me, was running rampant in the elite of the temple. It was being told of impending judgment and it did not repent. When I mean it, the temple culture, the leadership, the hierarchy. A couple weeks ago we looked at tyrant kings, Herod was involved some ways, or toxic leadership. The new kingdom promised in the scriptures, inaugurated by Jesus, would be built upon the foundation of the law and the prophets. The apostles and supremely Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. He is the rock. He is our captain. He's the author of our life spiritually and physically. And in this new creation, the one Jesus is building, I believe one of the things we can walk away from, because this has, this teaching is truth, but there are many pillars to God's truth and how we relate to them in 2022, in the church, personally, in a family, single, all these things. But one of the things the church is designed to be, I believe, hear me, First Baptist and all the other churches who find their foundation in Christ, we are designed to be a shelter from the storm. Now Jesus, on Calvary, absorbed the greatest storm in human history. We know this as Christians. This is how we are made right with God. This is in our righteousness. This is how we worship God rightly. My sins are forgiven. The veil has been torn. I have access to the Father through the blood of Jesus. And now I truly can call him Abba, Father. And in doing this, he has called us to come together as a people 
He has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. He has established a new temple. John chapter 2, verse 13. Let's read. Jesus exposes the corruption. This is a famous story. You've heard it. Hang with me. If you haven't, I'm glad you're here. And then he says something very interesting at the end of this section I'll read. John 2, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a den of robbers. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews, who were very upset, why Jesus was so upset? The temple elite were ripping off people. That's all I'm going to say. Their currency exchange rate for sacrificial temple sacrifices was way out of whack. That's all I'm going to say. I don't, I don't have time to go into it. So they were angry when Jesus did this. Verse 18, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show to do these things? Who in the heck are you, they say? How can you come into our house and do this? We are the center of Judaism. We are the center of Jerusalem. How can you do this? And Jesus answered John 2.19. Very important that we see this. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this building, and you will raise it up in three days. Verse 21, John's insight. Holy Spirit given this insight. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The true and perfect temple where we come to worship is the crucified, resurrected, ascended body of Christ. That's why we can gather as a church anywhere. So there is a new temple. It's the body of Jesus and there's a new house. It is the church that he has established. Even though we live on the West Coast, most of us, in America, most of us, and we have it pretty well, I can be honest enough to say life in 2022 is a storm for all of us. Now, there are varying degrees of the storms we face, but it's a storm. My heart for you as a person is that you would seek and find shelter from said storm, sin, anxiety, pain, everything that encompasses a storm, that you would personally find shelter in the person of Jesus Christ, but then collectively, as a church, we would find shelter together at First Baptist. My heart for our church as that we would be a shelter from the storm for all the people we come in contact with. My heart for First Baptist as we walk forward together is that we would be a shelter from the storm of 2022 and 2023 and 2024 because there are storms out there we will suffer and go through pain in life. Becoming a Christian or a part of a church doesn't change that. But when we become a Christian or a part of a church seeking the Lord, our role changes. We, be, we often become less victim mindset. You know, we have less of a victim mindset and more of a what? Servant mindset. We're going through this together. Let's bear the burden together. Let's help each other and love each other together. And then let's also look for other areas where we're led by the Lord to continue to build His kingdom. 
the alternative kingdom, the kingdom based on the death and resurrection of Jesus, the kingdom where our prescribed marching orders are in Matthew 5 through 7. I hope the question is popping in your head. Do I have a personal shelter from the storm? My sin, judgment that will come. I hope you're thinking about last week. What type of fruit am I bearing? Jesus is your personal refuge. But when we, and after we come to Jesus, we have another refuge, his church. How do we as a body at FBC, as a family, live as a shelter from the storm? Good question. We walk by faith. We're anchored in hope and we're known by love. We do that by placing our allegiance, our ultimate allegiance, not alone to country or to political affiliation or to job or to what we do, athlete, non-athlete, businessman, businesswoman. We don't place our ultimate allegiance there, but we place our allegiance, our faith in our life in the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. We obey what he has taught us. We seek righteousness, personal and corporate righteousness. We worship the Lord and justice. We live justly and we seek to do justice around us. We don't let media right or left define what justice is. Remember that there's lots of money to be made in justice nowadays. I'm just telling you. We let the scriptures define what justice is and we partake. We partake wholeheartedly. I'm going to read some des- a description at the beginning of the sermon of who these people look like biblically. And we'll close. It's so good to be with you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. Bless or blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We mourn personally when things happen to us. We mourn corporately when our beloved family members go through things. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I love this. I've heard it many times. Meek does not mean weak. Meek actually means usually strong. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Personally, individually, in our relationship with God, God, and then corporately, and it says, for they shall be satisfied. Most of the insanity in our world is because billions of human hearts are not satisfied. The pornography industry continues to be the largest, grossest industry on the internet year after year because human beings are not satisfied. I'll get off my soapbox. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is what the new house looks like. This is what the church looks like. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters. I put in daughters of God. They shall be called children of God, those who seek peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what the family, the members of the house built on a rock, look like over time. God is not done with us yet. That's why we have breath in our lungs. God will work with us. God will mold us. God will shape us. God will convict us. And he will call us to our true calling. A calling that was bought and paid for by his own son's blood. A calling worthy of the name above every other name, which would be what? Jesus called to his name. I'm going to wrap up. Pastor Jerome will be here next week. God bless you. If you have questions or comments or thoughts about the shelter from the storm, email, come see us, call us, do whatever you need to do. We're so glad you're here with us. 
even in this form online. We miss you. Join us next week for church and lunch if you want, and we'll see you soon. Let me pray. Father, thank you for goodness. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for language, imagination, emotions. Thank you for metaphors. Thank you for your son who taught so beautifully, vividly. Thank you that he is the rock that we can place our faith, our life, our hope on. And thank you that because of his life, death, and resurrection, we have a personal shelter from the storm, and now we have a corporate or a collective shelter from the storm. Help us here at FBC to model that. Help us here to be a hospital for the sick, spiritually, even physically. Help us to be an outpost of heaven. Thank you for this body. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. One more song. Enjoy your day. It's a beautiful weekend. Giants go!
Amen.